So here is John Tripolis to speak on medical practice on a Greek island in ancient times and today. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, it's, I'm honored to be invited here. Um, before we start, um, some initial geography may be useful. Um, I carry as a Greek island on the eastern Aegean Sea near the coast of Turkey. It allegedly bears its name from Icarus, the mythological figure who crashed on its shores. Um, <clears throat> it's about 25 miles long and two to six miles wide, making it about 100 square miles. Icaria is shaped uh, like a wing, or you could say like a seagoing vessel. So uh, its uh, shape obviously affects the wind patterns there. Most of the places we'll be talking about today are on the lee side of the island. Therma, um, right here, is the, uh, the site of the hot springs. Uh, Ios Kyrikos, near Therma, is the uh, capital and the uh, site of, uh, and the, site of the um, hospital. And actually, this Therma, Lefkas, is the site of the uh, leper colony that we're going to be talking about. Uh, it's a relatively isolated island with an obscure history, but lately has received much attention because the European Union's released statistics indicating that people on the island enjoyed a longer lifespan than anywhere else in Europe. I was born and raised in Cleveland, Ohio, but currently practice medicine in the General Hospital of Korea. I'm trained as a general surgeon, and I've been in practice here for just over five years. My father and my paternal grandfather also physicians were born on Ikaria Island, and the continuity for me is personally rewarding. Fairly often at work, I'll hear stories about my father's and my grandfather's patient care, and it's also rewarding that many of my father's and even my grandfather's patients are today my patients. Some of the reasons why a large percentage of people on this island reach the century mark may be the following. I mentioned that Ikaria is isolated. This is because it is uh, rugged, because of its rugged mountainous terrain and its lack of a natural harbor. As a result, it did not play a major role in, rich, in the rich ancient history of Greece, and even today, it is until recently an obscure region. In medical terms, this is not necessarily bad. Plagues and outbreaks of contagious infectious diseases were for the most part unknown on the island. Other boons to health are the island's plentiful water supply, which is lacking in many other Aegean islands. The Korea is situated in the Aegean in a way that exposes it to winds more than any other islands. Um, winds fresh and clean, mostly from the mountainous Balkans to the north, continuously rejuvenate the local atmosphere. And these gusting winds are a bane to disease-carrying insects, such as mosquitoes and houseflies. One of the few visitors that came to Korea in the pre-modern period was an Orthodox bishop named Joseph Georginis. He was writing about Ikaria in the 1670s. He marveled at the excellent level of health of the isolated and poor Ikarians and commented on their longevity and attributed it to the constant source of healthful air from these winds. Ikarian soil has been especially conducive to viniculture. As early as 500 BC, Ikarian wine was considered the best in the Greek world. Some ancient writers even report that Dionysus, the god of wine, was born there. A red wine is produced that is both commercially distributed and also a homemade product. The medicinal and health providing qualities of red wine have been known since Homeric times, some 800 years before Christ. According to Homer, Makon, the surgeon of the Greek warriors, would drink red wine mixed with barley and goat cheese for medicinal purposes. To this day, on the island, stories abound of remote village grandmothers and grandfathers who lived to be 100 plus years and whose daily breakfast throughout their long lives consisted of a piece of bread dipped in a tumbler of warmed homemade red wine. The health providing benefits of drinking red wine in moderation are constantly being promoted by doctors and nutritionists, even today in the daily media. Finally, nature has provided Ikaria with natural hot springs. And while in the classical period, this would be the period of around the Parthenon, uh, bathing in hot springs and the medicinal properties of such were not as popular as they would later become in later periods of antiquity, such as the Hellenistic and especially in the Roman period, the historical record points to the fact that bathing at the, at the hot springs uh, in Icaria was an expect, ex, accepted practice as early as the 5th century BC. 
this is based on taxes levied at the spa on the spa sites. Most of Ikaria's hot springs were located on the seaside village on the lee side of the island named Therma, think thermometer. And the name still remains such to this day. And, and it's right here. Um, <clears throat> the village uh, um, the village named at, at the end of the third century was briefly changed to Asclepius after the, after the healing god Asclepius. Presumably, the residents decided to change the name, the village's name, to advertise the healing qualities of the spa. In fact, there were several rivals to the Icarian Asclepius. There was also an Asclepion on the island of Ko, the home of Hippocrates, which offered hydrotherapy. It was built in the middle of the third, third century BC and opened its doors shortly before the naming of Icar the new name of Icaria's Therma village to Asclepius. This name, Asclepius, for the village lasted only about five years, from about 205 BC to 200 BC. And then the name disappeared from all known records. That said, Icaria probably had some sort of healing center or cure station associated with its natural hot springs throughout antiquity. Little remains of ancient Therma today, but by walking along the path some 400 meters east from the present day Therma, Therma Coast spot, 400 meters from here, it's all brush and scrub and that sort of thing, you, um, um, you can see the ancient, uh, you can, these are, this is the remains of the ancient uh, uh, healing center. You come to a place called Ruin Therma, where the surviving masonry suggests vestiges of a late Roman and early Byzantine bathing establishment that suggests a date about the 5th century AD. Now, this is much later than the period we're talking about. However, the rock channels and the square pool by the shore below probably much older. Most of this bath complex was washed into the sea uh, by an earthquake and was never rebuilt. So now we'll travel forward about 2,000 years in time to, uh, the 19th, to the early 19th century. Approximately in the year of 1810, there was an outbreak of leprosy, Hansen's disease, in Constantinople. Uh, the epidemic spread to the Turkish coast and to the neighboring Greek islands. Each island had to institute a separate facility to quarantine those afflicted with the disease. In Ikaria, three or four small houses and a church were built near the shore to house the lepers. There was community support for these patients, but since the locals were afraid to enter the, fa the facility, lest they become infected, they would leave food for the sick on the outskirts of the colony, and later the patients would come and retrieve it. The first known medical practitioner in Icaria was someone named Dr. Allore of Southern Italian descent, who treated patients in the 1850s. He apparently did not have a medical degree, but had practical training and would treat patients and prepare medications in his home. The first trained physician on the island graduated from Athens Medical School. He was born in 1862 and died in 1902. From that point on, Icaria had trained doctors in private practice, offering their services to the local population. Indeed, these physicians were held in such high esteem that many were elected to the national parliament by a grateful community as a reward for their life-saving services. It's remarkable that only that, that on this island of about 12,000 people, the inhabitants remained healthy under the care of only uh, three or four doctors at any given time. These private practice uh, uh, physicians maintained the status quo until the ma next major event in the history of Icarian healthcare, that is the building of the island's hospital in the late 1850s. Let me just show you some slides of the modern day baths today. People do come to, to Therma for, uh, to, to partake of these hot, uh, these hot springs as well. And this is sort of the bathing complex. Okay, this is a, uh, forgive me, this is a blurry slide, but uh, there's a reason for it. The, uh, the Greek government did not have a means to finance a hospital, and the building of the Icarus Hospital was an endeavor that is, for me as a healthcare provider, a remarkable synergistic cooperation between the local island community and the Icarians in the diaspora, mostly in the U.S., who had obtained financial security in their new country. It reflects the spirit of generosity and optimism and good intention that was prevalent in the United States in the late 1950s and early 1960s. Think the Marshall Plan, think the Peace Corps, etc. And it highlights the cooperation of two communities on two different continents achieving a common goal for the improvement of the quality of life on a remote island. A successful merchant in the coffee business in New York envisioned a hospital for Icaria in the mid-1950s. 
He set aside money for, of his own for this venture and persuaded the pan icarian Brotherhood of America to help raise money for the project. When the building of the hospital was completed in 1960, it was reported that the Icarians in the United States had contributed $65,000, in addition to the $40,000 personally contributed by this wealthy Icarian in the diaspora. And in 1960, that was a good sum of money. Concurrent with the philanthropy of the Icarian Americans, a local organization was founded uh, that roughly translated as the Ladies and Gentlemen's Club that was involved in the fundraising of the hospital on the island, as well as feeding and attending to the needs of the, uh, of the building site workers, and most importantly, organizing work crews from the various island villages. Each village was asked to send its residents on specific days to the construction site. These volunteers would assist with the manual labor and do related work on the site. As a result, establishing the hospital was truly a communal effort by the local and the diaspora Icarians. Uh, it's, I know it's blurry, but this is a, a group of villagers who had come to work that day and were photographed uh, as the hospital was being built. And this is the hospital. Were they, volunteering their services? they were volunteering their services, yes. And this is the hospital, it's the first manifestation of the hospital. Uh, <clears throat> Some, uh, some clinical uh, situations were beyond the, the scope of capability of, uh, oh, building the hospital was one, was one thing, but it was uh, soon uh, discovered that the funds were needed to uh, maintain it. The Icarians persuaded the Hellenic chapter of the International Red Cross to manage the hospital. From its inaugural year in 1960 until 1988 when it joined the National Health Service, it be, was, uh, was under the auspices of the Red Cross. When the hospital first opened its doors, its staff consisted of one physician, six nurses, one midwife, four cleaners, one cook, and one laundry worker. From 1961 until 1984, there was only one physician on, on staff at the hospital, and he was trained as an obstetrician gynecologist, but he did pretty much everything. He's well known. If he did surgery, he did medicine, he did pediatrics, he did everything. Um, some clinical situations were beyond the, scope, the capability of, of Icarus Hospital. And in the 1960s and 1970s, some were even beyond the capabilities of the great hospitals in Athens. To address this, the pan icarian Brotherhood of America created the pan icarian Foundation, whose charitable mission was to fund the open heart surgeries of Icarian children in need. From 1965 until 1981, the Foundation funded some 30 such operations performed by Dr. Robert Litwack at Mount Sinai Hospital in New York. Sadly, uh, Dr. Litwack recently died this past July. And I had the privilege of meeting Dr. Lickwack when I was a medical student. Uh, today, while Ikaria has the second smallest hospital in Greece, Ikaria's hospital is the island's largest employer, with a staff of about 200 employees, including 20 attending physicians representing all the major specialties in medicine, plus imaging, anesthesia, laboratory services, and blood banking. The National Health Service also provides sea and air transport for patients who require tertiary care. And this is the, what the hospital looks, looks like today. And they've added a wing over there. This is the, the group. This is the, where I work. And <clears throat> let me go back a little bit. Now, uh, with all this background, we can speculate how Ikaria became one of, one of the regions where people live the longest. Dan Buettner, a self-described explorer, educator, author, and public speecher, speaker who in 2005 wrote an article in National Geographic magazine about small pockets on the planet that were coined blue zones. At these blue zone areas, people live measurably longer lives and have a larger percentage of nonagenarians and centenarians than any parts, other parts of the world. Initially, Buettner discovered three such blue zones, Sardinia Island, Okinawa, and Lama Linda, California. Since then, the Nicoya Peninsula of Costa Rica and Icaria Island have been added to the list. A, a year ago, in the October 24th issue of the New York Times Magazine, Buettner published an article provocatively titled, The Island Where People Forgot to Die about his exploration of the longevity factor on Ikaria Island. It's reported that this article was the magazine's second most widely read last year. In the article, he interviews a series of Icaria's nonagenarians and centenarians and visits their home 
and does their best to probe into the secret of their long lives. Needless to say, there's a tremendous amount of interest in these types of stories, which give the impression um, that these centenarians have some strategy to live long lives. But in some ways, Butner misses the point. When these villagers wake up in the morning, they don't say, I'm going to do this and this and this so I can live to be 100. They haven't bottled the fountain of longevity, and that's the downside to these anecdotal stories. What's happening now is that they're marketing products from the island to potentially enhance longevity. Eat Ikaria honey so you can live to be 100. But Butner does discuss the daily lives of these remarkable villagers. It's a lifestyle that has been followed by for centuries that includes physical labor, such as gardening, walking a lot, eating low on the food chain, moderate consumption of red wine, and being an active member of the community that is interacting with all age groups in the community. And any healthcare provider will tell you that this lifestyle is conducive to a long life, and the people of Ikoria have been quietly living this way for perhaps since ancient times. So here's, uh, I don't know, it's not really that clear, but you, can, you can't really see, but all, everybody's dancing here. The kids are dancing, the older people are dancing. In the background, there's probably a, a, a nonagenarian that's sitting back and enjoying the dancing, and the whole kind of community interacts. And that, is, and that has something to do that they consider that with longevity as well, that, that everybody's sort of involved in the community. Our mission at the hospital, though, is to attend to those who have failed the Blue Zone concept. We see cancers and heart disease and the full spectrum of pathology at our institution and are there to serve these patients. What I think contributes to the longevity factor in Ikaria is a philosophy of life embraced by these nonagenarians and centenarians. It's a concept called afilokirdo and translates roughly into a disdain for financial exploitation. That your goal in life is to live your life as a decent man or woman and that seeking to profit from someone or something is secondary. From the interviews in Butner's article and from my personal experience with patients in this age group at the hospital, the concept of afilokido is an important part of their lives. These patients always express their profuse gratitude at the, at, at, for their care and wish upon me the blessing of, of their long, healthy lives, which I wish upon you as well. Thanks. The needs of the patient on the island, are they any different than uh, mainland Greece, um, or is there something uh, unusual about uh, their health care needs? I, I would say that, um, I would say that uh, mostly uh, it's, there isn't that much distinction between what goes on in the mainland and what goes on on the island. Of course, a lot of it's seasonal. During the summertime, we'll see a lot of uh, you know, automobile accidents, a lot of trauma, probably a larger percentage than, than, we, than you would see on the mainland and other areas. Um, but um, in general, and then in some ways, you could say yes, in that some of these patients from these remote villages, they sort of take their time in, in seeking health care. So we'll see it in, some, in a lot of instances, advanced disease. And our first question is, why didn't you come and see us sooner? Are you seeing a lot of uh, tourists coming to soak up the the, the long life lifestyle? <laughs> well, they're they're a little worried about that. They they like they kind of like to keep things the way they are. They like to send those type of tourists to uh, some of the other islands. But uh, some some pay, some people are coming to see that uh, coming for that reason and trying to find find a you know find the secret to longevity. Yeah, well, the name of the city, Therma, yes. or Thermi, is hot water. Right. That's the interpretation. Therefore, right. what is your opinion? Because there was a lot of talk about the, the radioactivity, which is in the island, the kind of radioactivity, that this is something that probably has to do something with the longevity of the people. What is your personal opinion about that? I'm really not in a position to comment on that. I, I think there's been a lot, a lot of people are, swear by these baths. There's a, a whole group, especially of, 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 of Greeks from the mainland, who come to, uh, come to take these baths with the low level radiation and, and, a few other, and a few other elements in there too. But um, there hasn't been anything objectively proven in terms of longevity. But, some, but for a while there, some of the insurance agencies would even uh, subsidize these patients to uh, come and take their baths there. Yeah. This may be a crazy question. You can tell me. I was under the impression that uh, leprosy was not terribly contagious. 
And I was wondering if when uh, people call it leprosy back in those times, it was really Hansen's disease or some other blemish that uh, was not diagnosed properly? Well, they, that's possible. The, back then, they didn't, of course, they didn't know about the, they didn't really start with modern uh, uh, therapy for leprosy until about the year 1940. They didn't, the, the first uh, drug therapy for that. Until then, there was all sorts of mythology and, and, uh, and, and thoughts about contagious disease, and probably that's the case. There, there, I did read something about that, that some of the, uh, that some forms of leprosy may have been misdiagnosed as some other diseases, syphilis or something else too. But uh, um, back then they just, you know, we're talking about 1810 and they didn't really get a handle on leprosy until about 1940 in terms of treatment. What about the young people on the island? Do they want to stay there or do they want to escape? Well, it's, it's funny, they, they do actually want to stay there, although their job prospects aren't, aren't you know, well, they aren't good anywhere in Greece these days, but they, they, um, there's a good uh, young, young person community and uh, they enjoy their lives there. And family is very strong, so people do, do stay, do, uh, do, do stick around. Thank you. Thanks for, uh, Presenting again, Dr. Kibalos. Um Chronic disease, do you see, or, you know, you mentioned that you do have, you know, a subset of, you know, patients or you do see things that we traditionally consider, you know, chronic disease, heart disease, diabetes perhaps. Do you see those in patients that are, you know, traditionally older or, or older than we would expect over here? You know, or do you see 80-year-old, 90-year-olds with diabetes? And, and how is it, is it, if you do, are they managed differently or is it, you know? Um, it's, it's a little bit of a difficult, it's a little bit out of my bailiwick as a general surgeon. What we'll, we'll see is mostly the trauma and the hot bellies and the, and, and the surgical diseases. So I'm, I'm not really in a, in a good situation to comment on, on, uh, on chronic disease. But they do have, uh, they, are, um, they are taken care of and they, uh, they uh, seem, that's about the best I can tell you. For, uh, for vascular disease associated with, um, with, with diabetes? We do our best not to, but yeah, we, we have to do occasionally. We, I, we've done a couple, yeah. yeah. You mentioned uh, uh, exercise. You mentioned wine. What about the diet? Is that any different than... Other well, I mean, parts of Greece, and it, you know, probably they have uh, uh, lower BMI than mine. Right. Um, well, I did mention low in, eating low on the food chain. So there are there are a lot of greens, a lot of legumes. Um, they 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 used to drink a lot of uh, brew a lot of teas from sage and chamomile and things like that. Um, so right. th there is now, but that's all starting to change as well too. I think the next generation isn't going to be as long living as their as their predecessors. You can go to the supermarket now and find potato chips and junk food and anything you want there. But uh, the people the group the people we're talking about now, the nonagenarians and the uh, centenarians, they they and they also endured some hardship too. They had to during the Second World War they, when the there was you know the Nazi the Germans had taken all the food, uh, they had to you know scramble and, and sort of live off the land as best as they could. And that probably added some years to their life as well. How does the island's um, Alzheimer's rate compare with other similarly situated communities? We, we, we do have, uh, I've seen my share of patients with, with Alzheimer's. Now, I, we don't really have a statistical bank, so I can tell you that, that, that supposedly according to the statistics that have been put out, that there is a lower rate of Alzheimer's disease. But again, uh, you know, from what I see in my daily practice, uh, you know, there, there's a, a, enough patients to s tell you that there is a, a substantial Alzheimer's uh, population. Now, what happens a lot is a lot of patients, when they, you know, go into the later stages of Alzheimer's, come back to Icaria, their family sends them back to Icaria, as opposed to putting them into a facility of some sort, they'll send them back to Icaria. So you'll see patients who have lived a lot of their life, of Icarian descent, who have lived a lot of their lives on the mainland, coming out to finish their lives on, on the island. Um, when I was um, on the island <clears throat> last month, um, I was told that people who had uh, advanced kidney disease were 
taken every day to a neighboring island to have dialysis and were coming back the same day, that three times a week. Uh, what about when it's, the, it's a small boat too? What happens when the weather is really bad? Can you comment on that, please? Uh, it's it's uh, one of the limitations of the National Health Care Service that we do not have a dialysis facility for these patients. And a lot of that is just, you know, management issues that, you know, making it cost effective and that sort of thing. At this point, it's considered more cost effective to have these patients go to neighboring Samos Island and have the dialysis done there. It's an inconvenience to the patient and there is a group of people that are trying to have dialysis, bring dialysis facilities to the island. But uh, at this point in time, it's exactly as you say. And when the weather's bad, they just have to stay put on the other island and, you know, keep... Uh, but do, they can move on. What's that? I mean, can you survive? You no, you stay put on Samos Island. You'd oh, stay put there and, 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 and you, wouldn't, you wouldn't stay put on... But if the weather's bad before you start <laughs> off, you're taking... Well, they, they, can, there's, they can arrange that. There's usually a way to get off the island some, some, some way or another. We're talking about one or two days where there's usually... A, a weather warning. I have two questions. One is actually relevant to the last one, uh, that if someone is dealing with a real emergency, so what do you do with these patients? Do you have like air transportation, Athens, yeah. where do you normally send them? I think I, I think I mentioned that the National Health Service provides us with sea and air transport. So okay. what will happen if there's something okay. that, that, that we can't handle is that I'll pick up the phone, I'll talk to a center in Athens, I'll present the case to the, to the doctors there, and I'll arrange the transport of that patient. Um, sometimes if it's, if it's just something that we can't handle, it's just something that we don't have, we'll send them by, on a speedboat to Samos Island if it's just one or two things that we can't do. If it's something even more significant, they will send a, a helicopter or an airplane to mm -hmm. pick up the patient. And I think that's something very generous considering the, you know, the mm -hmm. financial crisis that Greece is mm -hmm. under that they'll mm -hmm. pick up a, pick up a airplane and uh, send mm -hmm. it out to help somebody yeah. for my, a cold leg, for example, or something like that. My next question is, if there was, and that's probably not a fair question, but if it was one thing that you will do different, living and practicing as a physician on the island for five years now, what will that be that will have the, the most significant impact on the health care of the island? Um, hmm, uh, that's, that's a good question. I have to give that a think. Um, if there was one thing to do that, that would improve the health care the healthcare situation? Um, Well, you're you, you sort of asking me to revamp the whole system the way it's set up. Mm -hmm. uh, as it is right now, I mean, we could always get, say, a dialysis situation. We're working, yeah. it happens that we don't have a CT scanner. If we could get a CT mm -hmm. scanner, that, that for me would make my life so mm -hmm. much better. And we, a lot of times that's one of the things we have to mm -hmm. send the patients to the next island over is to get a, a head CT on, on patients that may or may not need them. And. Um, so I would say it would be something like that, just just to be able to get you know one or two other items of equipment that would uh, make that would uh, mm -hmm. you know make things just a little bit better. Mm -hmm. One question along the lines of moving patients from the island to Athens to receive better care: when and if these patients die, do they count as deaths of Icarians in Icaria or in Athens? My question really is, is there a self-filtering effect so that well, only the healthy stay on the island and the numbers look better that way? Are you talking about the emergency transfers now or are you Any talking kind. in general? I'm talking even 80-year-old people who are getting sick and they go to live with their children in Athens right. and who may die there. Right. Well, I don't know how they, that's a good question, how they count the statistics, uh, uh, how, how these statistics were. So there's no correction for that? There's no correction. And a lot of this is, there's a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of it's skewed. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure about that. Well, I'd like one comment and one question about the radioactive baths or radiant baths. Mm -hmm. uh, when I first went to the island way back in the 60s, they were trying to promote tourism and they, were, they painted on the mole in English trying to attract people, welcome to the island of radioactivity. <laughs> and and uh, that uh, proved to be counterproductive. Yeah. Yeah. It just took them a while to realize that and they, it's no longer there. Uh, the, um, uh, and the second point uh, that 
uh, uh, Dr. Fidus uh, just uh, made about um, the uh, statistics uh, about, you know, it, it was an interesting question, but I think it was an important question mm -hmm. because it bears upon the uh, European Union's uh, statistics about people living longer on the island. Do you really think they do? Do you think those statistics are accurate? I mean, I know uh, there are a lot of people, a lot of centena centenarians that I hang out with, I, you know, I, and they seem very lively and uh, full of life, but uh, uh, with all these health issues that we're talking about, and um, do you really believe that the figures on this island are great, that longevity is better there than er elsewhere, uh, particularly the neighboring islands. I know the neighboring islands, uh, some of them, and I don't see conditions being any different there than they are in the Korea. Um, well, all I can say is a lot of this information, and I made a point of that, is anecdotal. And it's patient, again, the way this, the article was read is that he would find patients and try and find out why they live so long. And, and again, and my only answer would be anecdotal too. I have seen a lot of centenarians who are just a remarkable phenomenon. They, you, their minds are clear, they're 100 years old, they're active, they're articulate, they're, they're that sort of, but I, statistically, because the community is so fluid and because they're, you know, there's, it's an island, people going back and forth to Athens, people, um, people doing um, th that, it's hard to really pinpoint something like that. But I think if you, the other thing is, I think if you embrace the lifestyle of these, of these centenarians, you're gonna live a longer and happier life.